Hello and welcome back to another Monster Monday, a series where I draw a creature from D&D and I talk about its lore and its history and what it's like to fight in game as well. Now these videos are based on your suggestions which you leave me down in the comments section below in these videos. And today's suggestion, this topic of etacaps, was first suggested by Emil Poi, P-A-A-U-W-E. Emil, anyway, all the way back on my Frost Giant video. So remember, if there's a monster that you'd like to see me draw and talk about, then make sure to leave your suggestion down in the comment section below and I'll add it to my to draw list. Then usually what happens is that I hand that to draw list to my patrons over on Patreon who get the chance to vote on which monster they'd like to see me draw next. However, one caveat to that rule has definitely taken effect here. Today's video was also requested by my now wife and Monster Mondays were actually her brainchild. So true to the rule of DM's girlfriend gets the best loot, I think she deserves to cut in line every now and again. Also, because I may have turned her character in our long-term weekly D&D game into an etacap via a horrific reincarnation process, and she asked to see these creatures and their lore to know better how to roleplay them, and I thought, you know what, this is a good idea, a good creature to cover, and a good way to help her roleplay her new spidery spidery self. So without further ado, let's get started with Etacaps. So Etacaps first appeared in 1981's Fiend Folio, a supplement for AD&D, which grouped together dozens of creatures from White Dwarf Magazine's Fiend Factory column, including some well-loved creatures like the Gith and the Kuotoa. In their first incarnation, Etacaps very closely resembled trolls or ogres as six foot tall, hairy humanoids with three hooked claws on each hand and foot. They had long, sharp noses, usually with a bit of a hook, and they had fanged teeth. And since then, they've gradually become more arachnid-like in each subsequent edition of the game that they've featured, until fifth edition, where they appear to have replaced their human-like features for enormous pincered mandibles, their hunched and leathery purple bodies are home to two arms and legs, the ends of which sit two hooked gripping claws. And this seems more fitting to me, as their name, Etacap, apparently comes from an old English word, Atterkoppa, meaning spider, and it's a fusion of Atter, meaning poison, and Koppa, meaning head. This is according to The Ecology of the Etacap, an article in issue 343 of Dragon Magazine, published in 2006. And this article will actually be the main source of information for today's video, because there's surprisingly little anywhere else regarding these creatures. Anyway, the word copper, although meaning head, is now synonymous with spiders due to its later adaptation into cob, as in cobwebs. Now, as for their in-game history, it's easy to jump to the spider-obsessed drow. After all, etacaps are spider humanoids and they prefer to live underground. Surely, surely they must be connected to the drow and Lolth the Spider Queen. Perhaps they were spiders given her monstrous blessing of intelligence, but no. Fortunately for these web dwellers, they are not Lolth's spawn. And there are two key factors that nod to this. Firstly, as I mentioned in my Lolth Monster Monday, Lolth, although queen of the spiders and a great admirer of their cold, unfeeling social hierarchy and cannibalistic nature, considers the fusion of humanoid and spider a punishment. Her creations of Driders, the most famous symbols of her, are actually a punishment. They're a curse to the drow so that she can use them to better effect. So the form of the etacap would probably actually displease her quite a lot. Secondly, etacaps are known as spider shepherds. It's actually one of the names that they go by as opposed to etacaps. And this is because of their inherent desire to care for, rear and train spiders. They appreciate them, they look after them, and they gather them in huge nightmare inducing flocks. And this cornerstone of their behavior is actually the key to their origins. Etacaps, believe it or not, actually stem from the ancient rituals of druids, the caretakers of nature. But let's be honest, you don't go from leaf-loving pacifist to the neutral evil monstrosity that is an etacap just through patting spiders on the head. No, these druidic rituals were old magic, the heavy metal of the magic world. 
These druids were obsessed with praising the unloved and overlooked sides of nature, and relished in revering vermin, putrefaction, disease, and savagery. Their rites and rituals segued into the cannibalistic, and through tainted blood magics, they attracted an entity of sorts. What this entity was is unclear, but it's believed to have been some kind of spider demon, and it suggested that it could have been one of the children of Miska, the wolf spider, another demon spider god, recently requested by AJ Pickett as a Monster Monday, so who knows, maybe I'll get to draw this creature in its foul splendour one day soon. Either way, these vermin druids saw this arachno-demon creature as a sign of the value of their rituals and practices. It must be doing something right if something so hideous is intrigued by what they're doing. Rather than being, I don't know, a very serious warning or alarm bell that they should maybe reconsider what they're practicing, they followed this creature's advice and its malicious ideas, eventually distorting these once humanoid creatures over their inbred generations that would follow eventually reshaping them into the fleshy Spider-Men that we now call Etacaps. At some point in their long and sprawling history, their patron demon prophet is said to have died, and the later, subsequent generations of Etacaps hold them in absolutely no regard. In fact, they have no gods and worship nothing. They have no civilizations, rites, practices, or rituals to cling to. And now, they are in fact pretty solitary creatures usually being entirely isolated from others, even of their own kind. Or, very occasionally, they tend to group together in pairs alongside their scuttling, hideous flock. But occasionally an Etacap matriarch may take it upon themselves to form a mighty horde of her kind, and gather together a collection of other trained monstrous spiders and form a miniature kingdom or clan of Etacaps. The Dragon Magazine article I mentioned earlier actually provides stats for previous editions of D&D for this matriarch. The only thing that really sets her apart from the traditional challenge rating 2 Etacap in 5e's Monster Manual is her ability to innately cast certain spells like Insect Swarm, Dispel Magic, Tree Stride, and Contagion. Her increased intelligence boosts her mind up to 10 in that stat, compared to the standard Etacaps, 7. But this creature also has a really intriguing ability, or rather, I suppose a passive feature, called Swarm Armor, which details that she constantly is covered in a writhing mass of young that will protect her to their absolute deaths. This swarm comprises of 20 temporary HP, recharging at dawn, that absorb hits that she would take before she can be harmed. Now this may just sound like something that is absolutely traumatizing, but just to sort of twist that knife, this actually happens in real life as well. There are a lot of spiders that carry their young, like a horrifying wriggling coat on their backs. And that's about as far as I'm gonna go into that because that mental image is about to give me a panic attack. But aside from that, these matrons seem like a really exciting way to spice up Etacap encounters if you were maybe getting a tiny bit bored of them as a DM but kind of continuing the stream of consciousness in regards to Etacaps and their children. Etacaps actually raise their young in a pretty typically nightmarish way. In fact, the main reason that they exit their cobweb-encrusted lairs is to lure adventurers and other fleshy creatures in to their homes with treasure and coins that they, ha that they have absolutely no need for themselves. And once something sufficiently meaty is lost within the maze of webbing that these creatures dwell in, they'll find themselves slowly hindered as they get caught up in ever-thickening strands of sticky silk, something that an Etacap, conversely, has absolutely no difficulty with. Thanks to a feature called a Webwalker, Etacaps ignore movement restrictions caused by webbing, and they also have a WebSense ability, allowing them to know the location of any creature in contact with a web that they're touching. So if you're in their lair, they can close in on your location with pinpoint accuracy. Now, once you're exhausted and scared in the dark of their lair, Etacaps will attack with a poisoned bite dealing 1d8 plus 2 piercing damage and 1d8 poison damage on top of that, hopefully poisoning you as well if you fail a DC 11 constitution saving throw. Now, once a creature falls unconscious, if the Etacap isn't hungry enough to liquefy them and eat their insides like most spiders do, they'll encase you in a capsule of webbing and string you up above a cluster of their eggs, sort of alien style, 
and wait for their brood to hatch. Etikap young are immediately starving upon birth, and will usually cannibalize each other. However, if the Etikap parents have the forethought to bring a still-living, ideally wriggling victim, and place them nearby, the Etikap young will swarm this creature instead, pouring through any wounds that they might have, their mouth, their ear canal, their eye sockets, and so on, until they can devour them from the inside, leaving only the creature's bones, belongings, and a sheet of leathery skin behind. <laughs> if etacaps aren't feeding their young, they employ a variety of other tactics to slay unwelcome travellers. Naturally, they can spider climb to stay out of line of sight, and they employ guerrilla tactics and stealth to their advantage, trying to avoid direct confrontation, seeing no great use for armour and weapons, they only have this one sort of basic poison attack with their fangs and 13 armour class. They do actually have a multi-attack, one of which will usually be that venomous bite, but they can also claw someone with their hooked talons for 2d4 plus 2 slashing damage. But again, it's not the best even for a challenge rating 2 creature. They prefer to encase a victim in a powerful web cocoon or use their strong webbing to perform other vicious acts of savagery. In the Monster Manual, there's a variant of Etacaps who can use a web garrot attack, which grants them advantage to attack when striking from above, grappling their quarry and dealing 1d4 plus 2 bludgeoning damage as they try to slowly squeeze the life from someone. The Dragon Magazine article actually goes further to suggest some sneak tactics to whittle down an opponent's HP or to lure them into an unwinnable situation. Here they suggest that Etacaps will sometimes sow false, perhaps empty cocoons on the edge of flimsy branches of trees so that adventurers will climb the tree to save whatever creature they think is inside the cocoon, only for this flimsy branch to break when the adventurer is at the top of it, under the weight of them causing them to fall into a formerly disguised poisoned spike pit below. Perhaps Etacaps will place numerous tripwires of spider silk all over their lairs, either garroting people or triggering traps. Or in their most disgusting and devious trap yet, they may fill the leathery husk left by their young, or via their own meal, with the false appearance of life by filling it with rocks and gallons and gallons of liquid webbing, which they will then kind of pilot a bit like a marionette puppet until concerned victims reach out to save them, at which point the skin is torn asunder and the victim is coated in all the sticky webbing that filled this container of fluid. So yeah, etacaps, they're awful. Now in terms of my own design here, I didn't stray too far from the Monster Manual version. The only thing I chose to do really was to cover these guys in quite a lot of hair. I went very tarantula-like with these creatures, mostly because tarantulas are the spiders that kind of give me the biggest creeps and I wanted these things to sit in this little alcove in the uncanny valley that would be quite unsettling to look at. To that end, I also wanted to give them more limbs than a standard humanoid. I wanted to give them some little vestigial limbs that maybe they can't use. Maybe it could hold the weight of a pencil or something like that. But something to make them the eight-limbed arachnids that they dream of being, even if those little limbs aren't very useful. And I don't know, maybe I was channeling the kind of character that my wife tends to play. Because even though I'm terrified of these creatures, I found it kind of cute, despite everything I've just spoken about. Now, if you wanted to play an Etacab, and again, make sure that your DM is okay with this, I have a little homebrew page on my website where I've included the stats for rolling up an Etacab character, which I'll leave a link to down below in the description box for your own use. They have some poisoning abilities and some pretty fun sort of Spider-Man-like abilities. There's a web spell that they get to use that essentially is like web swinging, and they have the ability to stick to walls, things like that. Your DM may very well find these guys overpowered compared to other creatures. But as I say, make sure to clear this with them before you roll up a character using these stats. They fit nicely into my campaign though, and I'm happy enough with all the abilities that they get access to. So I hope you enjoy it as well. But I think that'll wrap up today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to leave a little like down below, a little thumbs up, and perhaps favorite this video in case you want to come back to find this little homebrew. Maybe share it with the rest of your group who are living in blissful ignorance of the existence of Etacaps up until this point and need to have new fuel for their nightmares. I'm back from my honeymoon now, so they should return to my normal sort of scheduled videos. So I hope you'll join me again each Monday for a new Monster Monday. 
where I'll be returning to my patrons voting list. Which reminds me, if you want the chance to vote on which monsters I draw next, if you want a copy of this image for yourself, if you'd like a one-on-one -on -one chat with me, or if you'd like access to private sort of live streams that only my patrons get to see, I hope you'll head over to my Patreon page because all of your support like that really does help this channel to grow and helps me to make these videos every single week for you. It really is a very personal way to support the channel, so thank you very, very much if you choose to do that. But if not, I hope you enjoyed today's video just the same. So until next time, if you see a very, very suspicious trail of gold and treasure leading up to a cobweb-filled cave, don't go in. You don't need to be eaten from the inside out by a legion of hungry baby etacaps. So stay cautious. And until next Monday, happy monster hunting. <laughs>